All right, you guys have been asking me for this video, so here it is, a high yield guide to ventilators in the ICU. I'm just gonna try and keep this as short and sweet as possible, so let's just get right into it. All right, the first thing that we're gonna talk about is what are the reasons to intubate somebody? The answer to that is gonna be acute hypoxemic respiratory failure, acute hypercapnic respiratory failure, altered mental status, usually defined by a GCS less than eight, and severe acidemia. All right, so the first thing I wanna talk about is acute hypoxemic respiratory failure. The big thing that people are gonna to talk to you about all the time is hypoxia versus hypoxemia. The gist of this discussion is that these are two frequently confused terms and hypoxemia just describes a low oxygen content in the blood, whereas hypoxia is basically you're starting to have poor perfusion to tissues and you're starting to see end organ damage from that low uh, oxygen content. So basically hypoxia is worse than hypoxemia. You can have a COPD patient whose oxygen saturation is 88% and they're just kind of chilling there. You would call them hypoxemic, but they're not hypoxic unless they were starting to have signs of poor tissue perfusion from their hypoxemia. This is just a minor terminology thing that you might get asked about on your ICU rotation, but it just comes up surprisingly often, so I thought I'd mention it briefly. For acute hypercapnic respiratory failure, think about the COPD or asthma patient who's having trouble ventilating, getting uh, blowing off CO2, and so they need to be intubated to help increase their respiratory rate. Uh, otherwise, they're gonna tire out and basically go into sudden respiratory failure. Altered mental status is really because you need to protect the airway. So if somebody's like vomiting a lot or having severe GI bleeding, these are all other re reasons to intubate somebody is because you wanna prevent all of those secretions from going into their airway and basically causing them to arrest from a severe aspiration event. But if they're just very, very severely altered with GCS less than eight, any secretion that can also go down their airway. So any GCS less than eight is technically an in uh, indication for intubation. And then severe acidemia is again another indication. This is because uh, it may take some time to reverse this and patients are going to be very, very tachypnic to try and blow off that acidemia. And so they can also, like the COPD patients, can tire out if you don't give them the proper support that they need. All right, so now your patient is ventilated. So what are some ventilator basics that we should know about? So after a patient is intubated, the most common modes that you're going to see them placed on is going to be assist control. And then it's either going to be volume control or pressure control. Basically what assist control means is that the machine will be breathing for the patient at a determined rate. And if the patient wants to breathe more than the machine, they can initiate their own breaths and then the machine will detect that and give them a machine delivered breath. Volume control basically means that you're setting the tidal volume that the patient's getting, but the pressure can vary. And pressure control is gonna be you setting the pressure that the patient's gonna receive, but the volume, the tidal volume may vary. The choice between volume control and pressure control is really gonna vary between institutions. Uh, volume control does seem to be a little bit more popular, but you know, at my institution, pressure control is what we use right now. There are some more advanced modes that you may see uh, every now and then, such as PRVC, SIMV, and APRV but those are gonna be uh, a topic for another video that I'll make in the future. So for now, just kind of ignore those and we'll talk about volume control and pressure control. So the four variables that you can set are gonna be tidal volume, respiratory rate, PEEP, and FiO2. What you should know, and this is gonna be a very, very important question that you're gonna get asked all the time, is which variables will affect ventilation, which is gonna be basically your carbon dioxide levels, and which variables are going to affect your oxygenation levels. So tidal volume and respiratory rate affect ventilation, and PEEP and FiO2 affect oxygenation. So if your patient is becoming very hypercapnic, PCO2 is going up to like 70, 80, 90, something like that, then you want to address their tidal volume or respiratory rate to try and blow off that CO2. If their oxygen levels are really low and they're satting in the 70s or the 80s, touching the tidal volume and respiratory rate are not gonna do anything. You need to modify their PEEP and their FiO2 in order to fix the low oxygen levels. So now let's talk about uh, what to do after intubation. There's gonna be several things that you need to do. So after intubation, typically what we like to do is we like to get daily chest x-rays. You're gonna discuss getting different lines, such as a central line, A line, and an NG or OG tube. And then you'll need to do this kind of bundle that you'll see in the ICU, which is Fast Hugs BID. So this is gonna be addressing their feeding, analgesia and sedation, which I discussed in a prior video, so you can check that out on my YouTube channel. And T is for thromboprophylaxis, H is for head of bed elevated greater than 30 degrees, U is for ulcer prophylaxis. So you're gonna to need to put the patient on famotidine or pantoprazole, which help pr reduce stress ulcers. Um, also the enteral feeding that you're gonna be giving through the NG tube uh, is also a huge thing in preventing stress ulcers. 
uh, glycemic control. So you want their sugars between uh, 140 and 180. S is going to stand for sedation holiday. So every day you want to wake up the patient briefly so you can assess their mental status. And also this helps get them kind of extubated faster because you're allowing them to wake up every now and then. Then B is for bowel regimen. This is important because the patients are not going to be really moving that much. So you need to make sure they're not getting super constipated and obstructed. Then I is for indwelling lines. So every day you need to assess if the patient still needs their central lines or their A lines uh, and things like that. And then D is finally for de-escalate, uh, which basically means de-escalate antibiotics as soon as possible. Also, any time that you make a change to the ventilator, you should get an ABG 30 minutes after any changes. Or if you change the patient from supine to prone or prone to supine, you should also get an ABG 30 minutes to an hour afterwards to, to see how the body position changed also uh, affected their blood gases as well. Going back to the daily chest x-rays, the reason we get this is because they're going to have a lot of different lines in them. And so we have to assess the placement of them. Most particularly, you're going to be looking at their endotracheal tube, which is the breathing tube. And you want to make sure it's about three to five centimeters above the carina. You don't want it too deep because then you might intubate one of the main stem bronchi and then only be inflating one lung. And you don't want it too high either because it could come out and basically the patient beca could become extubated. So we want to get those daily chest x-rays to make sure all the lines and the tubes are in the right position. Also, most of the time, these patients have ARDS. So we are going to be assessing if uh, their ARDS is improving or getting worse at all. Remember that besides ABG, you can get a venous blood gas as well, but this is not going to give you your PaO2 or your oxygen levels in the blood. It's only going to tell you the pH and the PCO2. And the pH, you're going to have to correct by 0.05. So for example, if your VBG says the pH is 7.2, the equivalent pH on an ABG would actually be 7.25. One of the frequent re reasons that we actually get A lines is for frequent ABGs, uh, just because you know, sticking the patient very frequently in their radial artery is not the most feasible thing. It takes a lot of time from, from the nurses and eventually you're going to cause that artery to spasm off. So if a patient's going to need frequent ABGs, which most intubated patients are going to need, then you should get an A-line. Now I want to discuss uh, monitoring after uh, intubation and trying to see basically how patients are doing. Are they getting better or worse? What are some of the things that we're going to be taking a look at? One of the main things we're going to look at is the P to F ratio. And this is basically calculated by getting the ABG and you're going to get on the ABG, you're going to get a pH and then you're going to get a PCO2 and then a PO2. And then the patient's also going to be on a certain uh, FiO2. So say this patient was an FiO2 of 50%, then basically the P to F ratio is going to be this number divided by this number, which gets you 80 over 0.5 equals 160. So this patient's P to F ratio would be 160. The reason we look at their P to F ratio is because it gives us an idea if the patient's oxygenation is basically improving over time. And one of the things we look at to classify how severe somebody's ARDS is, is the Berlin criteria. So basically the Berlin criteria states that ARDS is defined by uh, respiratory failure within seven days, uh, bilateral pulmonary opacities, and then the P to F ratio determines the severity. So a P to F of less than 300 is mild ARDS, P to F less than 200 is moderate ARDS, and then P to F less than 100 is severe ARDS. The other things that we wanna monitor is that their peak pressures on the ventilator are less than 40 to 45 millimeters of mercury, that their plateau pressures are less than 30 millimeters of mercury, and that their driving pressure is less than 15. So just to illustrate this, say you have a pressure over time loop, your ventilator is gonna be providing breaths and you're gonna get a corresponding pressure curve like this. And what you can do is actually put an inspiratory hold, uh, which basically just kind of keeps the pressures where they are and you'll get two kind of calculated pressures. And so this is gonna be your peak pressure, and this is gonna be your plateau pressure. And basically what the peak pressure is going to represent is gonna be airway resistance or obstruction, whereas an elevated plateau pressure is gonna be a compliance problem. So just for some examples, a high peak pressure could be because of asthma or COPD where you have a lot of obstruction. And so it just takes a lot of force for the ventilator to push air into that system. However, the lungs themselves are gonna be pretty compliant. So in that situation, you'll have a high peak pressure, but probably a relatively normal plateau pressure. Uh, but in many cases, we're gonna have an elevated plateau pressure uh, in things like pulmonary edema, 
and ARDS, pneumothorax, those are all going to cause a compliance issue where the lung is just not really as um, stretchy as normal. And so your plateau pressure and your peak pressure are both going to go up if you have a compliance problem. If you're starting to hit pressures above uh, these values here, then you're really going to be increasing the risk for barotrauma, like you may pop a pneumothorax, for example. And so you're going to have to make some ventilator adjustments to try and get those numbers lower. And then finally, uh, let's talk briefly about the driving pressure. So the driving pressure is actually the plateau pressure minus your PEEP. And this value we want to keep below uh, 15. The driving pressure really just represents how much the alveoli are collapsing and then distending during gas exchange. And we want to keep it below 15 because once it's going above 15, basically your alveoli are just like opening and shutting and becoming huge. And basically there's a higher risk that they pop and cause uh, barotrauma as well. One common question that you're going to get is why do we use PEEP? So the importance of PEEP is that it prevents alveolar derecruitment. So say that you have a patient, um, this is their uh, trachea and then their bronchi, and then it goes into these segmental places and then they become smaller bronchioles. And then all of a sudden you get these little sacs, these air-filled sacs called alveoli at the end. So what we apply is this positive end expiratory pressure, which means that even after the end of a breath, we're still giving a little bit of positive pressure to help make sure that these alveoli stay somewhat open. What we really don't want them to do is just collapse and be basically become uh, atelectatic, which means the whole air area is collapsed because it takes so much more force to open those alveoli back up rather than just keeping them open with some peep and then just allowing proper gas exchange to occur. Imagine when you're inflating a balloon and when it's completely, you know, not filled with air at all, the initial amount of effort to get the balloon starting to inflate is much higher than once the balloon is already partially inflated. So that's why we provide this peep because this prevents the alveoli from collapsing and de-recruiting. And de-recruiting basically means they're no longer participating in gas exchange. We want to keep them slightly open so that it's basically like that partly filled balloon already. And it's just much easier to inflate and deflate. All right, next I want to talk about some important trials that you should know. So the number one trial that you should know is the ARDSNET trial. And this basically compared a tidal volume of six cc's per kilogram versus a tidal volume of 12 cc's per kilogram and found that the six cc's per kilogram group was uh, much superior to the 12 cc's per kilogram one. So nowadays, all patients will need to be on a low tidal volume uh, ventilation strategy. This is definitely the number one trial that you're expected to know on your ICU rotation. So make sure you know this. The reason these patients had such better outcomes is because uh, a lot of times with the 12 cc's per kilogram strategy, there was a lot more volume trauma and barrow trauma because at higher pressures, everything like that. And so uh, one of the lessons that we actually learned with this low tidal volume ventilation strategy is also to allow something called permissive hypercapnia. So we actually allow a patient to go uh, down to a pH of 7.2 or so, because that allows you to actually come down on their ventilator settings a little bit. They don't have to have as high of a tidal volume or respiratory rate, which really helps you reduce the pressures and the amount of volume that you're giving the patient. And so that's why we allow permissive hypercapnias in order to achieve this low tidal volume ventilation strategy. Number two trial I'd like you to know is the Proceva trial. And this basically stated that proning improved outcomes when P to F is less than 150. So in all of your patients who have a P to F ratio of less than 150, you should really start considering proning to see if that can improve their gas exchange. And the reason this improves gas exchange is because if I can just quickly draw a person right here who is supine versus a person who is prone, so basically the way that your lungs lie is kind of like this. So um, when the patient is supine, a lot of this lung that's on the bottom is kind of collapsed by gravity, right? There's a bunch of other organs and other body mass that's kind of collapsing all of this really useful lung tissue like that's lying on the bottom here. But when you prone the patient, all of this lung tissue is on the top, and instead you only get collapse at this area of the lung. And so you're basically improving the amount of surface area that you have for gas exchange. So that's why proning is effective for patients. And then the number three trial you should know is the Accuracis trial. And this one showed that paralysis improves outcomes when P to F is less than 150. And this is where we give paralyzing agents such as Vecuronium, Rocuronium, and Cisatracurium, and basically paralyzes the patients. It really allows their diaphragm muscles to completely relax and just allow the ventilator to do all of the work. And this improves outcomes compared to when patients are not paralyzed. However, this is a little bit more controversial because there was a more recent study called the ROSE trial, which did not find a similar mortality benefit uh, from paralysis. 
this. Remember from my sedation and analgesia video that anytime you're going to paralyze somebody, you need to make sure they have adequate sedation. Also, one thing I wanted to note about proning patients is that typically you're going to do proning for 18 hours and then supination for about six hours. And then you can kind of change that based on how the patient's responding. Sometimes you'll see 20 to four, et cetera. And then once the patient's P to F ratio is greater than 150, then you usually stop proning. All right, so next let's talk about weaning the patient from the ventilator and getting them ready for extubation. So first of all, uh, really one thing you wanna know is that our goal, PaO2, is 55 to 80. So if they are starting to go above that, then just start decreasing their oxygen. Usually the first thing that we're gonna do is come down on their FiO2 until it's less than 60%. This is because 60% is where you're really gonna get a lot of that free radical oxygen toxicity. So high levels of oxygen uh, really do pose a risk of causing uh, lung injury from free radicals. Uh, and then after we get the FiO2 down to less than 60%, then you're gonna start titrating the PEEP down. As this is going on, you wanna be doing daily spontaneous breathing trials and daily sedation holidays. So for the daily spontaneous breathing trials, you basically place the patient on a mode that's called pressure support. And basically this is just a low volume of PEEP that you're giving them, but they are actually doing all of the breathing on their own. There's really minimal assistance from the ventilator and you want them to do this for about 30 minutes and see how they tolerate it. Did they get very tachypnic? Did they get very tired out? Were they oxygenating okay? Um, but if they do well with that, then you can potentially extubate them. If you're more worried about the patient, then usually you prolong the uh, spontaneous breathing trial to like an hour or even longer sometimes. And then besides prolonging their spontaneous breathing trial, if you're worried they're gonna fail, uh, you can also what's called a T-piece trial. And this is basically an attachment that you place on their breathing tube in order to make it even more difficult to breathe. And so patients with COPD, or heart failure who have a higher chance of failing extubation, it's definitely a good idea to potentially consider a T-piece trial to make it more difficult for them. That being said, uh, you do want to extubate relatively aggressively. So uh, you should be having some failed extubations where you do have to re-intubate patients uh, because if you're not having that, then that's a sign that you are not uh, actually being aggressive enough in extubating people and you're having people on the ventilator for too long. That's a common pearl that you're going to hear on your ICU rounds. Another important thing to calculate uh, if you really want to figure out if a patient is going to fly with extubation or not is going to be the rapid shallow breathing index or the RISB score. And this is going to be defined by the respiratory rate divided by the tidal volume during their spontaneous breathing trial. And if this is greater than 105, this predicts a failed extubation. So you want to see this number less than 105. Also, you want to check for what's called a cuff leak. Basically, what happens here is you have the trachea and then you have the vocal cords and then the ET tube is here, and there's a little balloon that prevents the uh, ET tube from going back out. And what happens is over a long time, you can get some swelling around this area. And what you don't wanna do is remove this tube, and then the swelling just kind of cuts off their airway. So what we do is we check for a cuff leak. So basically, again, we have this setup right here, and we deflate the balloon, and then we look to, and we hear if there's any audible air leak from here. You also wanna look for a tidal volume decrease of 110 milliliters. And those are all signs that you have a successful uh, cuff leak, which tells you that there's no swelling around the ET tube and that it would be safer to extubate them. So the presence of a cuff leak is a good thing. Something else that we sometimes check, uh, but this is a little bit less common, is a negative inspiratory force of less than negative 25. This is uh, basically a sign of how strong their diaphragm is. And so in a lot of patients with neuromuscular disorders, this is something we check uh, prior to extubation, something like myasthenia gravis, for example, or Guillain-Barre syndrome. And then finally, patients should be able to follow commands. You don't really wanna extubate somebody who's not following commands. All right, and then finally, a few last things that I wanted to mention is that if you are going to extubate somebody with COPD or heart failure, who you're worried is gonna have a high chance of failing it, then you can extubate them to BiPAP which can help give them a little bit more support directly after extubation. And then if a patient is not able to progress down this and they're not weaning off the ventilator, then really you need to start considering potential tracheostomy. And so around ten, day 10 or so, then start considering if the patient will need a tra tracheostomy. This is because after about two weeks or so, uh, you'll start to get tracheal stenosis around the endotracheal tube. And that's just gonna be scar tissue that's gonna be very difficult to remove and it's gonna be kind of permanent. And so you need to get the breathing tube out and do a tracheostomy instead, which doesn't have as much foreign material just kind of sitting in their uh, airway. And so a tracheostomy can be done by either the pulmonologist or ENT doctors. And usually they're gonna to wanna to see the PEEP less than 10 and the FiO2 less than 60 
uh, before attempting to do a tracheostomy. All right, and this is pretty much all the high yield stuff that I think is basically the key things that you need to know for your ICU rotation. These are things that are gonna come up very, very frequently. You're gonna be asked on basically all of these questions. Uh, so definitely know every single part of this uh, presentation in my opinion. I really think this will be helpful for you. I think this gets you really on a good start for your ICU rotation. I know it's definitely a lot of information all at once, so feel free to ask questions down below if you have any. I'll also make some more in-depth videos about the other modes of ventilation and other ICU topics. Please let me know your thoughts and if you'd want me to go into uh, a little bit more detail about any of these particular subjects. Thanks again for watching. I'll see you in the next one and peace.